the philosophy of praxis, Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School by Andrew Feinberg. This is chapter 8, the last philosophy of praxis, Marcuse's phenomenology. In this chapter, I will bring the story of the Frankfurt School and philosophy of praxis to a conclusion. I first discuss phenomenological themes in Marcuse linked to his startling conception of a liberation of nature. The chapter continues with a discussion of the ontological significance of Marcuse's concept of nature and concludes with remarks on the relation of science and technology in critical theory. Despite differences in terminology, sources, and politics, Marcuse's argument is similar in many respects to Adorno's, but he emphasizes alienation rather than commodity fetishism as the underlying problem of advanced industrial society. This ties his argument more closely to Hegel, whose dialectic of master and slave is the original formulation of the concept of alienation. Marcuse's interpretation of Hegel's dialectic of essence resembles Adorno's concept of non-identity, but it also shaped, but it but it is sorry, but it is also shaped by this theme from the pheno phenomenology. Adorno would surely have rejected the teleological concept of history it implies. The significance of this difference becomes clear in the 1960s. Chapter 5 and 6 of One Dimensional Man present a remarkable synthesis of phenomenology and Marxism. Marcuse's argument can be clarified by reference to four main sources. Lucas's concept of reification, Heidegger's critique of technology, Husserl's late discussion of science and the life world, and Horkheimer and Adorno's theory of the impoverishment of experience under capitalism. The problem Marcuse poses is how to explain the connection between capitalism as a system of domination and scientific technical rationality. Chapter 5 contrasts pre-modern ontology with modern science. Chapter 6 then explores the connection between science and technology and concludes with a discussion of their political role under capitalism. This problematic is first articulated from within Marxism by Lucas in History and Class Consciousness. He signals the congruence of modern scientific modes of thought and the structure of everyday experience under capitalism. He describes the reified form of objectivity of experience through which it loses its human qualities and comes to resemble the facts of natural science. As we have seen in chapter 4 of this book, the form of objectivity is a neo-Kantian version of Kant's a priori preconditions of experience. But in contrast with the neo-Kantians, Lucas argues that reification derives from the commodity form rather than from the structure of consciousness. Marcuse sketches a history of rationality as a succession of such a priori preconditions. In ancient Greece, reason encountered a world of independent things, each with a meaning and purpose. For the Greeks, exemplified by Aristotle, these things are substances. As such, they are more than the sum of their mechanically related parts. They have an inner core that holds them together in the face of change. This core combines logos and eros. Things exhibit both rational structure and orientation toward a desired end, their telos. Aristotle introduced the world or introduced the word essence to talk about this core. It is the dynamic the dynamic center of the things being that drives it toward perfection. Here is and ought are harmonized in the notion of potentiality. As potentiality, value belongs to the objective world. It is not reduced to a subjective preference, as in the modern projection of being. The Greek conception is realized practically in techni, the knowledge associated with craft production and artistic creation. Like natural objects, artifacts have an objective essence, but unlike natural objects, they cannot realize that essence through an inner dynamic. They require the help of a craftsman. Techni thus incorporates the ends as well as the means. 
the final cause as well as the matter, form, and skills of the maker. This is objective rationality in Horkheimer's sense. Today we no longer believe in teleological substances. Instead, scientific reason offers mechanical explanations of a purposeless nature. The things of experience are broken up into measurable components, functional units awaiting transformation and recombination. The relations between these components are explained causally as a kind of machinery. This new concept of reason is the a priori of science, the precondition of its mode of experiencing and understanding the world. Marcuse follows Hegel in claiming that the domain of history responds to a different logic in which potentiality still has a place. He does not envisage a return to the Greek world that is neither possible nor desirable, but he does attempt to, re to reconstruct the idea of potentiality in modern terms as the relation between value and fact in social life. Logical truth becomes historical truth. The ontological tension between essence and appearance, between is and ought, becomes historical tension, and the inner negativity of the object world is understood as the work of the historical subject. This historical reconstruction of the concept of essence provides a standard for the critique of modern society, and especially its science and technology. In his 1930 book, Hegel's Ontology, Marcuse argues that reality has two dimensions, empirical existence and the essence of the phenomena, the potentialities striving toward realization. As a historical thesis, this implies a progressive vision in which the potentialities are expressed in social struggle. But in One Dimensional Man, published in 1964, Marcuse argues that advanced capitalist society restricts thought and action more and more to the first dimension. This one-dimensional society tends to reduce everything to its empirically given form, suppressing the second dimension of essential potentiality. Thus, what Adorno calls identifying thought prevails. It blocks recognition of the inadequ inadequacy of the av available satisfactions and the dangers of unreflective technological advance. Like Adorno's distinction between ordinary and emphatic universals, Marcuse's distinction between formal and substantive universals corresponds to the two dimensions. Formal universals classify objects in accordance with quantity and quality. They refer to the empirical, the factual. Substantive universals such as freedom and equality point beyond the facts toward the potentialities. These potentialities are not unreal, but are implied in the manifold connections and the history of the phenomena, their constellations. The objects of everyday experience reveal themselves as incomplete, as still fraught with possibilities. Knowledge of this second dimension depends on the imaginative power of the human mind, which transcends the given toward its essential meaning. The validation of the transcending content of the substantive universals today is based on the actual technical potential of the production system, which could provide a better and freer life under a different political and economic dimension or dispen dispensation. <laughs> dimension. By contrast, science works exclusively with formal universals. It projects a world of quantitative determinations dissolving the objects as a substantial reality. In eliminating the dimension of essence, science exposes the object to mechanical explanation and technical manipulation. It does not recognize potentialities, but only the empirically given facts. In practice, it serves those with the power to establish the facts and, re and reinforces their power. Science has two essential features, quantification and instrumentalization. It does not address experience in its immediacy, but transforms everything it encounters into quantities. Since quantities are alien to values, this stance eliminates purpose from the world. This is the basis of the value neutrality of science, its indifference to the good and the beautiful and the interests of the true. But values do exist and require some sort of locus. Hence, correlated with the quantified reality of science, there is an inner world of subjective feelings 
in which everything associated with value takes refuge. This inner world is excluded from the objective world science explains, hence also from the domain of rationality. The scientific world, now stripped of any value, valuative features and disaggregated, is exposed to unrestrained instrumental control. Within the context of, re of research, this instrumentalism appears innocent enough. Science learns by manipulating its objects in experiments. The prior quantification of the objects makes it possible to draw preci precise conclusions from these manipulations. But the innocence of science is lost when the possibilities of instrumental control are exploited on a much larger scale by technology. Like Heidegger, Marcuse concludes that the technical applic applicability of science is no accident. A technological project lies at its basis. The science of nature develops under the technological a priori, which projects nature as potential instrumentality, stuff of control and organization. The unity of science and technology lies in the fact that the quantifiable reality of science is an instrumentalizable reality for society. What for science is a measurable object of experiment and explanation is raw material for production in society. In both cases, the a priori concept of the object proceeds and makes possible its appropriation by rational theory and practice. Marcuse's critique of science and technology reverses the Marxist thesis according to which socialism will free the technical forces of production, blocked by outmoded capitalist relations of production. Marcuse insists instead that the existing technology dominates both human beings and nature. The forces of production themselves must be reconstructed on the basis of life-affirming values. Their mere growth is not progressive. A social revolution must interrupt the continuity of domination now installed in the very structure of the machines. This requires a break with the continuity of the technical apparatus of productivity, which, for Marx, would extend, freed from capitalist abuse, to the socialist society. Such technological continuity would constitute a fateful link between capitalism and socialism because this apparatus has, in its very structure and scope, become an apparatus of control and domination. Cutting this link would mean not to regress in the technical progress, but to reconstruct the technical apparatus in accordance with the needs of free men. Marcuse's critical strategy is complex. On the one hand, while he never calls into question the cognitive value of natural science and technology, he argues that they have been incorporated into the capitalist system and are part of its apparatus of exploitation and alienation. But he also believes that science and technology are historically contingent and that they may be transformed in the future. Thus, the critique is not entirely negative. On the other hand, Marcuse's critique extends beyond actual science and technology to the a priori cultural form that determines them. This technological a priori operates throughout social life, determining the experience of objects generally, even those remote from scientific and technological intervention. This aspect of the critique is to some extent independent of the first. Marcuse cites several passages from Heidegger's writings in support of his concept of the technological a priori. Heidegger explains that the essence of technics, Marcuse's a priori, is a project of mechanization. Modern man takes the entirety of being as raw material for production and subjects the entirety of the object world to the sweep and order of production. The use of machinery and the production of machines is not technics itself, but merely an adequate instrument for the realization of the essence of technics in its objective raw materials. In Heidegger, the essence of technics is a dispensation of being, but Marcuse argues that it has a social basis in capitalism. He quotes Horkheimer and Adorno, who trace its source to the capitalist transformation of labor. By virtue of the rationalization of the modes of labor, the elimination of qualities is transferred from the universe of science to that of daily experience. Marcuse draws on phenomenology to analyze this transfer. 
Modern science is adjusted to the requirements of a universe of self-propelling productive control. It is not the goals of science or its particular theories that are so determined, but the structure of scientific rationality. The projection of nature as quantifiable matter would be the horizon of a, of a concrete societal practice which would be preserved in the development of the scientific project. How has this come about? Marcuse rejects a causal explanation and turns instead to Husserl's analysis of the relation of science to the life world. The concept of life world refers to everyday experience. Husserl understands experience not in terms of the famous sense data of empiricism, but as a system of meanings immediately available to consciousness and enacted in ordinary practice. In Heidegger, a similar concept is called simply world. For both these phenomenological thinkers, science derives ultimately from a life worldly basis. The a priori form of the scientific enterprise, its concepts and methods are not the autonomous creations of pure reason. They appear to be but they appear to be, but are based on aspects of everyday experience in this phenomenological sense. But unlike Husserl and Heidegger, Marcuse argues that experience is traversed by social contradictions. He writes that the life world is a specific mode of seeing within a purposive practical context. Under capitalism, the context is the project of the domination of nature. Individual non-quantifiable qualities stand in the way of an organization of men and things in accordance with a measurable power to be extracted from them. But this is a specific socio-historic project, and the consciousness that undertakes this project is the hidden subject of Galilean science. That subject is the capitalist class, or in another reading of Marx, capital itself. The concept of project Marcuse introduces in this passage derives from Sartre, who employed it to emphasize the freedom of the subject to choose its path in life. A project is not a particular plan of action. It is what Heidegger calls the projection of a world, that is, an ordering of experience around a certain way of being in the world. Particular plans become possible only within a project projection of this sort. In Sartre and Heidegger, these terms are ontological categories of individual existence, but Marcuse historicizes them as civil civilizational categories, referring to the freedom of whole societies. On this account, capitalism is more than an economic system. It projects a world in the phenom phenomenological sense of the term. The congruence of science, technology, and the form of experience is ultimately rooted in the logic of capitalism. Existing science and technology cannot transcend the capitalist world. Rather, they are destined to reproduce it by their very structure. They are inherently conservative, not because they are ideological in the usual sense of the term, nor because their understanding of nature is false, but because they are intrinsically adjusted to serving a social order that ignores potentialities and views being as the stuff of domination. Thus, technology has become the great vehicle of reification. The development of this argument is anticipated in a precis pre of one-dimensional man that precis pre pre <laughs> of one-dimensional man that Marcuse wrote while teaching in France in the late 1950s. This text contains once again a significant reference to Heidegger but not just to the late Heidegger, famous as a critic of technology. Marcuse also goes back to being and time for a conception of technology as intrinsically oriented toward human needs. He writes, a machine, a technical instrument can be considered as neutral, as pure matter, but the machine, the instrument does not exist outside an ensemble, a technological totality. It exists only as an element of technicity. This form of technicity is a state of the world, a way of existing between man and nature. Heidegger stresses that the project of an instrumental world precedes, and should precede, the creation of those technologies which serve as the instrument of this ensemble, technicity, before attempting to act upon it as a technician. In fact, such transcendental knowledge possesses a material base in the needs of society 
and in the incapacity of society to either satisfy or develop them. I would like to insist on the fact that the abolition of anxiety, the pacification of life, and enjoyment are the essential needs. From the beginning, the technical project contains the requirements of these needs. If one considers the existential character of technicity, one can speak of a final technological cause and the repression of this cause through the social development of technology. This is a peculiar passage, a kind of metacritique posing as an interpretation. It translates Heidegger's existential analysis of worldhood as a system of instrumentalities based on a generalized concept of care into the historically specific concept of technicity. Heidegger's care has become the orientation toward human needs intrinsic to instrumental action as such, including modern technology. But service to human needs has been blocked by capitalism. Thus, Heidegger's ontology of instrumental action, unifying human being and world in terms of unspecified possible ends, has become a normative account of the failure of capitalist technology to realize quite definite ends. Marcuse sets up the contrast between a truncated technological a priori aimed exclusively at domination and an, and an alternative a priori that would fulfill the, the telos of technology in the creation of a harmonious society reconciled with nature. Technology is not neutral, but ambivalent, available for these two different developmental paths. Compressed in these few lines is the move Marcuse made in the early 1930s. From Heidegger to Marxism via Hegel and Marxist manuscripts of 1844. In the manuscripts, Marx describes the ontological unity of man and nature in terms of labor. Translated into Heideggerian terms, this would be equivalent to being in the world as the ontological condition realized in everyday instrumental action. But Marx's notion has a normative character Heidegger's does not. The fulfillment of rich and complex human needs through the application of human capacities and powers in labor contrasts with the impoverishment and alienation of capitalism. In Heidegger's case, there is, to be sure, what Marcuse calls a final technological cause but it is left completely vague relative to the contingent project of Dasin or Dasin. That vagueness would seem to be the condition for its ontological significance, whereas from a Heideggerian standpoint, Marcuse's turn toward need appears merely ontic. Why, given these differences, did Marcuse retain this curious reference to Heidegger? As we will see later in this chapter, Marcuse follows Marx in attributing ontological significance to need. Furthermore, Heidegger's concept of a transcendental project is useful for grounding the opposition of capitalism and socialism in his historicized theory of the a priori preconditions of experience. Marcuse claims that the capitalist project of technological domination of nature is historically contingent another world is possible. But for this other world to enter history, it must be reflected in the actions of an agent. Now that the proletariat no longer plays that role, whole swaths of Marx's theory are obsolete, especially the idea of class consciousness, central to Lucas's version of the philosophy of praxis. Marcuse substitutes the idea of a radical transformation of experience for that outmoded idea the form of objectivity of a capitalist society is reflected in a truncated experience, but a richer experience is adumbrated in art and the oppositional movements. The leap from the rationality of domination to the realm of freedom demands the concrete transcendence beyond this rationality. It demands new ways of seeing, hearing, feeling, touching things, a new mode of experience corresponding to the needs of men and women who can and must fight for a free society. The new mode of experience would mediate between the existing society and a new society based on a harmonious relation to nature. 
the liberation of nature. Walter Benjamin introduced the notion of a liberation of nature in his 11th thesis on the philosophy of history. The contrast he formulates between exploitative or exploitative and liberating labor is familiar except that Benjamin refers not to the exploitation and liberation of human beings, but of nature. He does not hesitate to give this unexpected application of Marxist categories its full utopian force. He writes that the social democratic con conception of labor amounts to the exploitation of nature, which with naive complacency is contrasted with the exploitation of the proletariat. Compared with this positivistic conception, Fourier's fantasies, which have so often been ridiculed, prove to be surprisingly sound. According to Fourier, as a result of efficient cooperative labor, four moons would, illum would illuminate the Earth's night. The ice would recede from the poles, sea water would no longer taste salty, and beasts of prey would do man's bidding. All this illustrates a kind of labor which, far from exploiting nature, is capable of delivering her of the creations which lie dormant in her womb as potentials. Nature is a kind of reverse or negative image of society in the early Frankfurt School. It appears as a necessarily lost utopia. This pessimistic view is not contradicted by the implicit irony of Benjamin's purified seawater and extra moons. But environmentalism has given a more substantial content to the notions of exploitation and liberation of nature. Adorno and Horkheimer do not relate the utopian promise of nature to concrete environmental issues, which only enter public discussion in the 1970s. However, Marcuse does address ecology explicitly on terms that appear to follow directly from Adorno's elliptical remarks on nature discussed in the previous chapter. As usual, Marcuse enthusiastically breaches Adorno's self-imposed limits, and this makes for a more explicit and decisive presentation. In a 1972 speech, he wrote that nature has a dimension beyond labor, a symbol of beauty, of, a tr of tranquility, of a non-repressive order. Yet this nature is being destroyed by capitalism. Marcuse's essay on nature and revolution represents the furthest advance of the Frankfurt School toward environmentalism. He argues that value-free matter, material, there only for the sake of domination is a historical a priori pertaining to a specific form of society. A free society may well have a very different a priori and a very different object. The development of the scientific concepts may be grounded in an experience of nature as a totality of life to be protected and cultivated and technology would apply this science to the reconstruction of the environment of life. He goes on to suggest the possibility of a liberation of nature that would be the recovery of the life-enhancing forces in nature, the sensuous aesthetic qualities which are foreign to a life wasted in unending competitive performance. These potentialities of nature hark back to Aristotelian essentialism, but refracted through Hegel's historicism Potentiality is a dynamic, future-oriented principle rather than an essence in the Aristotelian sense, i.e. that which the thing always already was. It is not constructed speculatively as a fact independent of humanity, but comes into view in the course of actual struggles and reflects the essential involvement of human beings with lived nature. Those struggles are based on the imaginative capacity to project a better future a technology transformed by those struggles, would be respectful of its objects, both human and natural. In this context, science and technology would be the greatest vehicles of liberation. Marcuse foresees a reconciliation with nature through a new technical practice based on an aesthetic form of, ob of objectivity, but he adds an important proviso to his theory of the liberation of nature. Marx's notion of a human appropriation of nature retains something of the hubris of domination. Appropriation, no matter how human, remains appropriation of a living object by a subject. It offends that which is essentially other than the appropriating subject, 
and which exists precisely as object in its own right, that is, as, as subject. Marcus here reaffirms the Frankfurt School's fundamental thesis of the non-identity of man and nature, subject and object, but there is also a sense in which his theory is an affirmation of harmony through participation in a non-exploitative relation, surrender, letting be, acceptance. The Frankfurt School's insistence on non-identity is superseded by a different kind of identity, the identity of nature and subject and object, which is recognized in reflection and aesthetic appreciation. Marcuse knows that the utopian conception of nature he shares with Adorno appears unscientific, even regressive, but these are resolutely modern thinkers who resist theoretical backsliding. They are not looking to re-enchant nature or to merge with it in a romantic unity, yet Marcuse links his argument directly to several surprising comments in Adorno's aesthetic theory that appear decidedly pre-modern. There, Adorno claims that human beings are called to help nature to open its eyes, to help it on the poor earth to become what perhaps it would like to be. Marcuse seeks a non-metaphysical interpretation of such notions, a third term beyond pre-modern essentialism, and the idealistic kitsch of a new age. He finds his answer in Kant's aesthetics, which defines natural beauty as purpose purposiveness without purpose. Nature exhibits characteristics of an object constructed for a purpose without actually having been so constructed. Marcuse interpreted purposiveness in this sense as a purely formal property of self-organizing objects. It arises from freedom. The self-production of the object according to its own intrinsic nature, its growth potential, we can distinguish the freely developed living thing from the mutilated product of a constricted growth process. The distinction manifests itself in formal properties we associate with health and beauty. This conception supports a normative understanding of nature and its tendencies. Exactly how is this supposed to work? Adorno considers this idea and draws utopian conclusions from it, but stops short of accepting its literal truth. He writes that natural beauty recollects a world without domination, one that probably never existed. Natural beauty hints at the idea of freedom that corresponds to such a world. But Adorno concludes, nature is in reality a realm of unfreedom. And so the aesthetic appreciation of nature is deceptive, a suggestive misapprehension. Marcuse takes a different tack. Natural beauty and its purposeless purposiveness express the flourishing of life. A concrete libidinal attachment to the world underlies the aesthetic dimension. This attachment is historically variable, restricted by scarcity in the past and suffering a peculiar reduction to sexuality in the present. But Marcuse also argues that advanced technology tends to generalize aesthetic perception, albeit in the specific context of the market. Here, Marcuse's comments are prescient. He notes the emergence of a new relation of worker to machine, a more distanced and informed relation due to advancing automation. This is the emergence of a free subject within the realm of necessity that Marx had predicted for socialist society. It leads to an aesthetic relation to the products of the new technology. Already today, the achievements of science and technology permit the play of the productive imagination. Experimentation with possibilities of form and matter hitherto enclosed in the density of unmastered nature. The technical transformation of nature tends to make things lighter, easier, prettier, loosening up of reification. The material becomes increasingly susceptible and subject to aesthetic forms which enhance its exchange value. The artistic moderni modernistic banks, office buildings, kitchens, salesrooms, and salespeople, etc. This aestheticization of the built world primarily serves capitalism, but it is ambivalent, contributing to the emergence of a new form of, of oppositional consciousness that appears in the new left as an erotic mode of presence. Its full development awaits a liberated society pleasure and beauty would then express a less affirming sensibility.
beauty would relate the given to its potentialities and sensation, rather than selling a product or serving as a temporary escape from competitive strife. Concepts such as beauty, health, potentialities have an intuitive appeal. It is obvious that strip mining wounds nature in Adorno's sense. By contrast, the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright is far more compatible with the unfolding of the potentialities of its living setting. In one of his last speeches in 1979, Marcuse developed this contrast in its implications for environmental struggle. He argued that ecological devastation is an effect of capitalist productivity against which the life instincts rebel. That rebellion inspires the new left. What we have is a politicization of erotic energy. This, I suggest, is the distinguishing mark of the most radical movements today. These movements do not constitute a struggle to replace one power structure by another. Rather, these radical movements are existential revolts against an obsolete reality principle. They are a revolt carried by the mind and body of individuals themselves. A revolt in which the whole organism, the very soul of the human being, becomes political. A revolt of the life instincts against organized and socialized destruction. Disgust and rage at the abuse of human beings is an aesthetic expression of our sensitivity to suppressed potentialities. It articulates their value at the existential level. At that level, the subject does more than observe the given state of affairs. She participates in it vicariously. This is the other side of the coin of mutual participation in which Adorno found the meaning of peace with nature. On Marcuse's account, participation is experienced as solidarity. Disgust and rage at harm to the environment would inspire its less destructive appropriation within the human world. But, after all, is Marcuse's party pre for life more than a sentimental preference? Apart from, apart from killing what is not life-affirming in some sense, and indeed even killing in self-defense might qualify, nature goes on in one form or another regardless of what human beings feel and do. Why single out its flourishing around a Renaissance palace, neatly tucked into the landscape? or rights falling water. Nature flourishes in a garbage can too, especially one uncollected for a week. But this is not the affirmation of life we recognize as normatively valid. Does this mean our intuitive understanding of life affirmation is an arbitrary and subjective opinion without normative force? Not necessarily. There is a difference between our intuitions and the counterexample insofar as the former seem to be rooted in our nature and are generally shared, while the latter is a mere intellectual construction set up for the sake of argument. To call the multiplication of bacteria in a garbage can an example of flourishing is to ignore the emphatic meaning we normally give the term. What flourishes is not simply a mass of cells, but the realization of such values as vitality and grace through the free development of living things in which we recognize a certain fa uh, family resemblance or affinity. The concept is necessarily anthropocentric, if it is to have any force at all. A garden or a child flourished bugs merely multiply. Furthermore, the introduction of life as a value in public discourse is not arbitrary. It makes sense in a context of permanent aggressive warfare, racial conflict, mass imprisonment, and extensive poverty. This was the context in which Marcuse wrote, and, it's still, and it is still our context. From Psychology to Ontology Marcuse's late conception of nature is ambiguous. He seems to hover uncomfortably between psychology and ontology. In Eros and Civilization, he regards the nature of lived experience as the object of the erotic drive in the Freudian sense. But too strict an adherence to Freudian psychology would undermine Marcuse's philosophical argument with empiricism and naturalism. Experience does not have ontological significance from a psychological standpoint. 
drives in Freud are subjective objects of study, not ontological affirmations of being, nature, as Marx claims. As a natural science, psychology implies a transcendent nature, indifferent to the projection of our feelings and fantasies. But Marcuse remarks that it seems permissible to give Freud's conception a general ontological meaning. This unusual interpretation of Freud implies phenomenological themes Marcuse only alludes to, but which are essential to his argument. Marcuse's philosophy of nature is, of course, rooted in Hegel and Marx as well as phenomenology. As he wrote in one early text, Hegel is concerned with the process of reification and its transcendence as the basic happening of human life, which Marx then, then represented as the basic law of historical happening. Marcuse's philosophy of praxis continues the, the tradition by reifying nature, uncovering its essential implication in human existence obscured by technological rationality. These themes are developed in Marcuse's early writings, especially in his first book on Hegel, although without the reference to Freud. They provide the bridge between psychology and ontology in his most daring late works. For Eros to acquire ontological value, life must be considered as a form of being revealing nature in something like Heidegger's sense of the term, rather than as just another natural object. In his Hegel thesis, Marcuse interprets Hegel's concept of life in terms that echo Heidegger's concept of being in the world. His argument can be read without reference to Heidegger, but in a thesis dedicated to Heidegger, written by his assistant at the time, it is difficult not to see an attempt to reconstruct Hegel's concept of life in quasi-phenomenological terms. Marcuse implicitly returns here to Heidegger's own early term for what will later be called Dasein, namely factical life. Life in this phenomenological sense is not independent of the environment with which it engages, but establishes its identity through that engagement. Being in the world refers to a structure of meaning that grounds the reified opposition of subject and object in a prior unity. Interpreting Hegel, Marcuse writes, the world in which life unfolds exists only as its world. At one and the same time, therefore, the world is the ontological presupposition of life as well as the externality and negativity in which life has lost itself. In Hegel, the activity of the living being is a transformation and appropriation of nature. Nature is not an indifferent obstacle in this conception, but forms the subject's essential milieu. Through its free activity in this milieu, the subject realizes itself. In Hegel's remarkable phrase, it comes to be at home with itself in its other. The opposition of subject and object is thus grounded in an ontological relation, one that holds among beings themselves. This bond precedes all knowledge and in fact makes factual knowledge possible. In sum, a world is revealed in the unity of subject and object that transcends their division in inauthentic, objectivistic accounts of experience. That world is not factically present, uh, present but underlies cognition. Epistemology is thus subordinated to ontology. Truth is not first produced by method, but inhabits experience itself prior to any cognitive labor. Shortly after finishing his Hegel thesis, Marcuse had the opportunity to read Marx's newly published Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844. Here, Marcuse found his interpretation of Hegel confirmed and radicalized. Man does not have objects merely as the environment of his immediate life activity and does not treat them merely as objects of his immediate needs. He can confront any object and exhaust and realize its inner possibilities in his labor. He can produce in accordance with the laws of beauty and not merely in accordance with the standards of his own needs. In this freedom, man reproduces the whole of nature and through transformation and appropriation furthers it along with his own life, even when this production does not satisfy an immediate need. 
Thus, the history of human life is at the same time essentially the history of man's objective world and of the whole of nature. In the later work, these themes are taken up through the reinterpretation of Freud. Freud's theory of the erotic provides the basis for a radical reinterpretation of aesthetics. The erotic drive is not merely psychological, but has an ontological correlate in the beauty of lived nature. This correlation is necessary for experience to play a role in Marcuse's critique of technological rationality and its one-dimensional ontology. Erotic experience in this sense is not merely subjective. It has the scope of a Heideggerian attunement, a mode in which reality as a whole is given. Marcuse's concept of lived nature and its beauty must overcome the transcendence or tra transcendence of the nature of natural science if it is to have this ontological significance. He must validate experienced nature by incorporating it into the historical process in opposition to the ahistorical construction of external nature in the scientific worldview. At the same time, he must not invalidate scientific and technological knowledge that he concedes are essential for any modern society, including a socialist society. Although Marcuse's remarks are all too brief, he has such a theory. In One Dimensional Man, he distinguishes the, the physical structure of matter from the historical form it acquires as object for a subject, but he concludes that the two layers or aspects of objectivity physical and historical, are interrelated in such a way that they cannot be insulated from each other. The historical aspect can never be eliminated so radically that only the absolute physical layer remains. This passage maintains the distinction between natural science and history within a fundamentally historical ontology. Agreeing with Hegel and early Marx, Marcuse argues that all forms of knowledge and experience are essentially social, rooted in the we of society rather than the I of a pure epistemological subject. There is thus no pure thing in itself or nature totally unconnected to humanity. This view, widely shared in one form or another in Marcuse's early milieu, guarantees experiential knowledge against naturalistic reduction to psychology. The historical standpoint is ontologically fundamental. No view from nowhere threatens to reduce it to an accident of biology. The early Marx anticipates Marx, uh, Marcuse's historicist ontology with his concept of the irreducibly meaningful character of experience, but in contrast with phenomenology, and on this point he follows Marx, not Heidegger, Marcuse also recognizes that access to meaning is contingent on the, re on the evolution of needs. Technical advance does not merely serve pre-existing needs, but produces new needs corresponding to the development of human faculties and capacities. These new needs introduce a higher dimension of fulfillment by relating human beings to the meaning of their experience, to music rather than sound, to home rather than shelter, to a meal rather than sustenance. The restriction of human development by capitalism motivates the revolution. At the everyday level of human life, this is about poverty and the, dam and the damage it causes. But once subject and object are redefined as life and world, the revolution is an affair of reason. The world does not yet but must someday correlate adequately with its living subject. The unity of subject and object is thus not merely a speculative concept, but becomes a historical demand. All this is explained in Marx's manuscripts discussed here in Chapter 2. Marcuse comments, it is only the Marxian conception which, while preserving the critical transcendent element of idealism, uncovers the material historical ground for the reconciliation of human freedom and natural necessity, subjective and objective freedom. That material historical ground is the de-reification of reified capitalist society reification as Marcuse uses the term, and here he follows Lucas, is not just a mental attitude, but is also a cultural pattern affecting institutions and technologies. Marcuse calls it one-dimensionality in his later work, 
but he already distinguishes a second dimension in his Hegel thesis to refer to the level of essential potentiality in contrast with the empirical facts. Dereification is the establishment of that second dimension in consciousness and as an active force in social life. This is not merely a local event. Reification is the form of a rational culture, a culture that proves its superiority to earlier cultures based on myth by discovering the truth of nature and revealing the human basis of history. This is the progressive conception of Marxism, which sees in capitalism a universal, if limited, achievement. As I argue in chapter 6, dereification follows reification in transcending any particular culture to achieve a certain universality. Just as reification reaches out to encompass the entire globe in rational structure, so dereification follows it and reveals the human potentialities it suppresses. Revolt thus gives insights of general validity no less than science, technology, and economics. This dialectic is implicit in Marcuse's concept of aesthetic form as one of the necessities of being, universal beyond all subjective varieties of taste, affinity, etc. In recognition of its universality, Marcuse proposes that the aesthetic imagination should be included among Kant's transcendental forms of experience. As such, it would be coextensive with the objectified world of space, time, and causality on which science and technology are based, and on a mere psychological or sociological phenomenon. The great conception which animates Kant's critical philosophy shatters the philosophical framework in which he kept it. The imagination unifying sensibility and reason becomes productive as it becomes practical a guiding force in the reconstruction of reality, reconstruction with the help of a Goya, uh, Gaia Scienza, a science and, te and technology released from their service to destruction and exploitation, and thus free for the liberating ex exigencies of the imagination. The rational transformation of the world could then lead to a reality formed by the aesthetic sensibility of man. Such a world could, in a literal sense, embody, incorporate the human faculties and desires to such an extent that they appear as part of the objective determinism of nature. This is what allows Marcuse to claim in his essay on nature and revolution that there is an existential truth in things in nature. This truth is existential in the sense that it is experiential rather than scientific. The fact that experience is always our experience and not that of an imaginary pure rationality means its anthrop anthropocentric character is unsurpassable. But it is not a mere psychological construct. Rather, rather, it is the condition of another kind of knowledge different from scientific knowledge. That knowledge arises as a synthesis, reassembling the bits and fragments which can be found in distorted humanity and nature. This recollected material has become the domain of the imagination. It has been sanctioned by the repressive societies in art. The existential truth so understood is not only pro propositional, but also constitutes the horizon of experience under which the immediacy given form or in which the immediately given forms of things appear as negative as denial of their inherent possibilities, their truth. Experience thus has a normative character. We do not perceive the world as scientific reason apprehends it, as a meaningless order of primary qualities in abstract space and time. The secondary qualities belong essentially to the sensed world, and these include the objects of lived judgments of good and bad, beautiful and ugly, experienced directly in the act of sensation. These qualities reveal the potentialities of nature, what perhaps it would like to be. With these remarks, Marcuse echoes Adorno's concepts of constellation and non-identity. But unlike Adorno, Marcuse envisages struggle to realize those inherent possibilities, the truth of things. 
Experience offers a non-scientific knowledge that is also a force driving history toward higher levels of freedom. The negative becomes positive in this struggle. Negative thinking draws whatever force it may have from its empirical basis. The actual human condition in a given society and the given possibilities to transcend this condition to enlarge the realm of freedom. In this sense, negative thinking is by virtue of its own internal concepts, positive, oriented toward and comprehending a future which is contained in the present. In Lucas, de-reification is confined to suppressed humanity, but Marcuse's implicit ontology does not allow for a separation of the human and the natural. The aesthetic Lebenspalt is a being in the world. His ex existential truths are attributed to an aesthetic faculty that transforms not only human life, but nature itself. Human beings can, in Marx's astonishing phrase, form things in accordance with the laws of beauty. These reflections help us to understand Marcuse's hyperbolic claims for technological change. Perhaps the most astonishing of these claims is his revival of the surrealist notion of hazard objective. In an essay on liberation, this is the notion of a transformed world in which human faculties and desires appear as part of the objective determinism of nature, coincidence of causality through nature and causality through freedom. This dualistic conception of liberation maintains the unity and difference of nature and society. It once again poses the problem of the relation between reified rationality in the form of science and technology and the concrete content of lived experience. Socialist technology lies at the intersection of two disparate sources the scientific understanding of nature in terms of causality and respect for human and natural potentialities, formulated as meanings. This intersection takes the form of what I have called a technical code. Such codes translate between the two worlds of reason and experience. They represent social demands in the form of technical specifications. Meanings encountered and experience gain technical salience through such translations. Technology is not autonomous, but essentially imbricated with society through this process. The sidewalk ramp is a good example. Until it was introduced, disability was a private problem. The interests of the disabled were not represented in the design of sidewalks that obstructed their movements at every crossing. The universal rationality of sidewalks was particular in its exclusion of the disabled. But once society accepted responsibility for the free movement of the disabled, the design of sidewalks translated the new right. This recognition takes the form of a design specification representing the disabled. The sidewalk becomes more universal in responding to an enlarged range of interests, arranged more nearly corresponding to humanity as a whole. Something like this concept of technical code is implicit in Marcuse's discussion of capitalist technology, which he argues is designed for domination. One dimensional man makes a similar point explicitly in relation to socialism. The historical achievement of science and technology has rendered possible the translation of values into technical tasks, the materialization of values. Consequently, what is at stake is the redefinition of values in technical terms as elements in the technological process. The new ends as technical ends would then operate in the project and in the construction of the machinery, and not only in its utilization. An essay on liberation draws out the ontological implications of this conception. Technique, assuming the features of art, would translate subjective sensibility into objective form, into reality. There not only are meanings embodied in technology, but lived nature is itself reshaped in response to its technical mediation. As Augustine Burke has shown, there is no better illustration of this than the production of landscape in the course of history. The technical work of traditional agriculture not only yields food, but also a meaningful organization of space.
Socialism must do the same for industry with respect to the whole material base of modern society. Or modern civilization, sorry. Marcuse's concept of nature lies at the core of his philosophy of praxis. The revolution takes place not only in society, but in things as well. The historically charged categories of critical theory operate to resolve the philosophical antinomy of humanity and nature, frozen in place by both naturalism and idealism. The contraries are reconciled through the transformation of the technology that binds them together in a unity. Science or technology. Philosophy of praxis has a critical relation to science and technology from the beginning, but at the same time it resists the unqualified rejection of reason characteristic of much romantic thought. Nevertheless, its critique of scientific abstraction and the dehumanization effects or dehumanizing effects of industrial technology seems anti-modern and technophobic. This leaves philosophy of praxis vulnerable to the charge of romantic irrationalism. There are real difficulties involved in constructing a dialectic of enlightenment that does not recap recapitulate the errors of conservative cultural critique. The vagueness of the Frankfurt School critique of science and technology leaves room for doubt. This issue is part of a larger one that concerns the politics of rationality in modern society. This conundrum already makes it its appearance in Marx, whose critique of science and technology under capitalism leads not to a return to traditional sources of authority or to romantic passion, but to the demand for a new science and technology. Lucas and the Frankfurt School offer more moderate but still highly speculative discussions of the prospects of rationality under socialism. Can we find a better grounded solution today on the basis of our much more sophisticated sociological understanding of science and technology? Lucas exemplifies the treatment of science and technology within philosophy of praxis. He criticizes the quantification of being under capitalism. All the phenomena of scientific and technical progress, economic markets, the transformation of the labor process, bureaucratization of the economy, and the state are tied together by a reifying logic stemming ultimately from the fetishism of commodities. He claims that the quantitative methods of natural science applied to society yield reactionary ideology, but he admits that applied to nature they contribute scientific progress. Properly understood, society is subject to a qualitative historical account based on a functional hermeneutic in which the economy plays a central role. He never explains how the two contradictory sides of this equation might come together in a socialist technology, both scientific and social, both quantitative and qualitative. The lacuna is critical for the Frankfurt School. If technological domination is conceived as the simple realization of the quantifying procedures of science, then the transcend transcendental argument would seem to exclude socialism insofar as it too relies on technology. Adorno and Horkheimer attempt to solve this problem in Dialectic of Enlightenment through distinguishing the instrumental uses of rationality from the faculty of reflection. They argue that universal quantification betrays the real power of thought. The reduction of thought to a mathematical apparatus condemns the world to be its own measure. The expulsion of essences through the reduction of things to their measurable aspects leaves thought helpless to criticize. Measure the world. Science is thus complicit with capitalism. This complicity involves more than supplying capital with machines. It also corrupts experience itself. Abstract labor and the fetishism of commodities becomes touchstones of experience, stripping it bare of normative qualities. The elimination of a proper measure deprives the individuals of a basis on which to resist conformity to society's demands. 
The true purpose of technology, the preservation and enhancement of life, is lost. As we saw in the last chapter, Horkheimer and Adorno argue that modern scientific technical rationality is both committed to domination by its quantifying reduction of the real and destined to serve humanity as a whole through its objective form as, mach as machinery. The mutilated capacity for reflection must be recovered to realize this destiny. Only in reflection can human beings recognize their, national, their natural limitations and thereby moderate, moderate their struggle to dominate nature and each other. To save enlightenment from itself, they must overcome the damage capitalism has inflicted on experience and reason. A reflective humanity can orient the struggle toward its proper goal. This argument is merely hinted at in Dialectic of Enlightenment. Horkheimer and Adorno seem to have no idea what a successor, what a successor technology would, look, would be like. What is more, they do not explain what positive motive could move masses of people to reflect, nor what reflection would reveal to them beyond their own limits. Perhaps the implausibility of such a development explains the growing gap between Horkheimer and Adorno's philosophy and their politics, culminating in their violent rejection of the new left. The new left was, was received very differently by Marcuse. His transcendental framework led to a far more radical conclusion than the bare emphasis on reflection and dialectic of enlightenment. The movement instituted a new a priori of experience that would not only release the critical power of reflection, but also lead to the transformation of technology. This would be a two-dimensional experience responsive to the potentialities of people and things. In effect, he developed a substitute for the original Marxist theory of class consciousness, and on that basis conceived a unity of theory and practice once again. Marcuse's appropriation of phenomenology from Marxism is thus central to his argument and enables him to develop a positive concept of revolution incorporating technology for the first time. Here is how he describes that concept in an unpublished late essay. Only the vast capabilities of science and technology of the scientific and artistic imagination direct the construction of a sensuous environment. Only if the work world loses its alienating features and becomes a world of human relationships. Only if productivity becomes creativity are the roots of domination dried up in the individuals. No return to pre-capitalist, pre-industrial artisanship, but on the contrary, perfection of the new mutilated and distorted science and technology in the formation of the object, object world in accordance with the laws of beauty. And beauty here defines an ontological condition, not of an oeuvre d'art isolated from real existence, but that harmony between man and his world, which would shape the form of society. The vision is exciting, but is it coherent? Marcuse has no more explanation than do Horkheimer and Adorno for how a quantifying science and technology would be appropriated in the context of the socialist transformation he projects. This is a damaging inconsistency in the Frankfurt School's critique. It is already visible in Lucas's theory of reification that is the source of all such critiques. Marcuse wavers between two strategies for overcoming this difficulty, the reenchantment of nature through the transformation of science and the institution of respect for nature through transformed technology. The latter strategy resolves the antinomies practically independent of the evolution of science. Either or both of these strategies can succeed in fulfilling the requirements of the philosophy of praxis but they are not equally plausible, and Marcuse does not distinguish them clearly. Marcuse mentions the transformation of science briefly in One Dimensional Man. The emergence of an aesthetic Lebenswelt holds the promise of a new science that will assimilate the aesthetic qualities that emerge in the full experience of nature. The new science will discover value in the very structure of its objects. The antinomies will be resolved through a representation of nature in which their opposed poles are reconciled, subject with object, value with fact. In a confusing passage, Marcuse attributes qualities such as beauty, 
that today's science does not recognize to the nature of a future natural science. But he immediately rejects the idea of a return to a qualitative physics, and so undermines this notion even as he evokes it. In any case, he imagines the transformation of science as the long-term consequence of a new mode of experience, rather than as a political task of the revolution. Science might gradually evolve in new directions through genuine discoveries stimulated by life in a liberated society. But no one can anticipate, much less dictate, the science of the future. The alternative to the theory of the new science is the reconstruction of technology on the basis of experiential knowledge. Technology would be reshaped by respect for the potentialities of human beings and things. This evolution would release the aesthetic imagination from its marginal role under capitalism to a central place in the design of technology. Here, the antinomies are not resolved by a changed representation of the world, but by a new practical relation to the world. The philosophical significance The philosophical significance of the revolution would depend not on a new science, but on a technology shaped by the new a priori of experience. Unfortunately, Marcuse does not distinguish between the emergence of new scientific concepts and methods, and new technical codes and designs. He leaves the impression that socialism awaits an unimaginable cognitive advance, a new science of nature rather than much simpler technical changes well within our reach today. Not surprisingly, this theory is met with a generally skeptical response. The innocence of science. Even if the technological option correctly interprets Marcuse's intent and overcomes the usual objections, there are still problems with the critique of quantification. These problems concern what science and technology share, namely, precise rational methods of calculation and control. Like Heidegger, Lucas, and his Frankfurt School colleagues, Marcuse wants to extract grounds for critique from these features. But he admits that they cannot be eliminated from technology even in a socialist society. If that is so, then the objectionable aspect of capitalist technology must lie elsewhere. But where? In a Habermasian framework, one might argue that the term domination is inappropriate as a description of the scientific technical quantification of being. The neutral term control would be a better description with domination reserved for specific uses of scientific technical powers. But as I explained in chapter 7, the solution to the conundrum is not to revert to this outdated notion of the neutrality of science and technology but to understand their social implications in a more complex framework. All these theories confuse the shared a priori precondition of science and technology with a unity of purpose and consequence they need not share. The command of nature, Bacon prophesized, is common to both, but this is not sufficient grounds for identifying them without distinction. Without going as far as Habermas in restricting the use of the concept of domination, it is still important to note that the link between capitalism and natural science is fundamentally methodological, not substantive. The economic system and science share a reliance on quantification as exemplified by commodity fetishism and measurement, but they do not share the same relation to society or serve the same goals. The concept of domination does not in inappropriate does not seem inappropriate when applied to natural sciences such as physics, chemistry, and geology, rather than to their contingent social issues. Of course, social needs often inspire research. Some scientific objects and research programs clearly reflect specific power relations or ideologies, but the most profound link between capitalism and natural science is its construction of nature as an object. At this level, science is relatively neutral with, res with respect to the ideologies and values circulating in modern society. A technological attitude towards nature will be shared to some extent by any modern society, including a socialist society. Yet, even here, where its connection to social forces is remote, the very neutrality of science cancels the consideration due to the potentialities of human beings and things. 
but it is only conservative in its social implications to the extent that its prevailing technological applications ignore those potentialities as well. The important link between technology and capitalism is not pure method, but a particular application of the method. In this context, neutrality is an ideological choice. Crudely put, science treats potassium, cyanide, and magnesium hydroxide indifferently as natural substances, but administering one or the other to a living human being transforms them into poison or medicine. The choice has nothing to do with scientific technical rationality, but the technological a priori contains an inherent potential for domination insofar as it allows one to conceive the conditions of life and death indifferently as, na as natural. That potential, need, that potential need not be actualized. Indeed, society has structured the institution of medicine specifically to exclude neutrality as between life and death. Unfortunately, no similar exclusion protects workers and nature from the harms of industri industrialism. Thus, even though scientific technical rationality is not exactly innocent, there is a difference between the theoretical representation of nature and the practical response to social forces in the construction of useful artifacts. To get from research to social facts, an essential mediation is required. That mediation is the design process itself based on technical codes that embody social demands and technical specifications. The scientific technical conception of nature enters the social world through formally biased technical realizations. These realizations depend not just on rational principles, but also reflect the understanding and intentions of social actors. Technology relies on scientific knowledge at the level of causal effectiveness, while also participating in the meaningful contexture of ordinary experience. Technology thus lies between reason and experience and cannot be identified completely with the abstract understanding of nature of natural science. Because it functions in and responds to far more substantive aspects of the life world than science, technology has distinctive characteristics. The theory of formal bias explained in chapter 7 shows how the apparently contradictory world relations of the scientific, technical disciplines and everyday experience are combined in design. Counteracting the potential for domination implicit in science and technology requires incorporating values protective of life in design. Designs ans answering to such values are routinely found in pre-capitalist societies. This is the work of craft, but craft belongs to societies of scarcity in which class rule is based not on technology, but on myth and force. Under capitalism, craft traditions are abandoned and the underlying population excluded from the design process. Capitalism revolutionizes production and subordinates the whole society to technical power that becomes the new source of legitimacy. Thus, capitalist technology fully unfolds its potential for domination not only at the level of its particular objects, but generally, socially. This situation can be reversed, where design takes into account the potentialities projected by a democratic process informed by a humane imagination. Marcuse thus argues that technology must again incorporate an objective final cause. Teleology returns as an attribute or attribute of artifacts responding to human and natural potentialities. He writes, the technical mastery of final causes is the construction, development, and utilization of resources, material and intellectual, freed from all particular interests which impede the satisfaction of human needs and the evolution of human faculties. In other words, it is the rational enterprise of man as man, of mankind. And again, the critique of technology aims neither at a romantic regression nor at a spiritual restoration of values. The oppressive features of technological society are not due to excessive materialism and technicism. On the contrary, it seems that the causes of the trouble are rather in the arrest of materialism and technological rationality. That is to say, in the restraints imposed on the materialization of values. 
Here, the original telos of rationality is, re is restored. Reconciliation with nature. Technological domination is neither intrinsic to technology nor inevitable wherever technology is employed. Design is the mediation through which the potential for domination contained in scientific technical rationality enters the social world as a civilizational project. Capitalism realizes that potential by extending it without limit to every aspect of nature and human beings. When technics become the universal form of, mater of material production, it circumscribes an entire culture. It projects a historical totality, a world. The break with that world does not immediately transform science, although in the long run it may have consequences for the scientific conception of reality. However, the break does, does require an immediate engagement with technology. Although Marcuse treats it as a revolutionary task, that engagement does not await the revolution. It begins long ago as excluded actors protested the side effects of the dominant designs. Such protests were commonplace in the labor movement as it grappled with the threats to health and safety caused by the Industrial Revolution. The theory of reification illuminates this experience and links it to contemporary protests around such issues as environmental pollution. Resistance from below provides the impetus to revise technical assumptions and designs. These considerations belong to a dialectical critique of technology that is neither irrationalist nor technophobic. Struggles over technology and other rational systems intrinsic to modernity promise the resolution of the antinomies not through conceptual innovation, but rather through the practical transformation of the relation of human beings to each other and to nature. Note that it is not a question of attitude. Marcuse would have would have dismissed a merely subjective reconciliation. The focus on design differentiates his solution from such unconvincing notions as Heidegger's free relation to technology, or the many appeals to voluntary simplicity emanating from a certain wing of the environmental movement. The point is not just to change attitudes toward technology or material goods in general, but to reconstruct the industrial system in accordance with different values. This is the concrete liberation of nature in which philosophy of praxis culminates. Here in summary are the main points of Marcuse's position. Horkheimer and Adorno would have agreed with most of them. 1. Experience of nature is historically shaped. The nature revealed under the technological a priori is not the last word on the truth of being, but may be transcended in another a priori. Two, the technological a priori of modern societies reveals only an aspect of experienced or lived nature. That aspect has become the basis of science and technology, and also of a cultural system that suppresses or derealizes other aspects. Three, a nature understood on restricted instrumental terms stands opposed to human beings who fear and dominate it. This is the origin of the philosophical antinomies of matter and spirit, fact and value, necessity and freedom. 4. Other aspects of lived nature include aesthetic beauty and potentialities. These aspects of nature are objective in the sense that they belong to the object of human perception. They are not subjective illusions. 5. These aspects are revealed to sensation informed by the erotic and imaginative faculties. These faculties belong to a fully developed reason, as opposed to the restricted instrumental rationality of modern societies. 6. The, dif the differentiation of these faculties from rationality is an effect of scarcity in class society. Technological advance has made this differentiation obsolete, even dangerous, since reason uninformed by eros and the imagination is an increasingly destructive and self-destructive force. 7. A free society in which erotic imaginative faculties flourish would encounter a different nature from the restricted one of today. Human beings would be at home in that nature to a far greater degree than they are today. 8. 
Such a society would interact with nature through a different technology that was more respectful of nature's potentialities and limits. This technology would still serve human needs, but it would do so less destructively. 9. Human liberation and the liberation of nature go together. These two forms of freedom are not identical. They still presuppose a relationship of differentiated subjects and objects, but in a liberated society they will be able to achieve a harmonious relationship. 10. The failure of restricted instrumental rationality is increasingly obvious and may but need not lead to a revolution in favor of new social forms based on cooperation, solidarity, and respect for nature.